Good morning. Welcome to St. Mark's this morning. If you're just strolling through, come and have a seat. Good morning. Well, thank you. Good morning to everyone at home on the live stream. Welcome to St. Mark's. If you come here visiting, my name's Jason. Great to see you all here today. Um, it's really great to be able to catch up. Um, for me, not, a, not much opportunity to see a lot of uh, the guys at church, um, except in this sort of format. Um, and it's uh, also, uh, even though we'll be able to catch up and uh, be able to pray and be a church together remotely on different weeks, there is still something to be said when we'll be able to see each other and be able to talk to each other and fellowship in this sort of way. Over the last few weeks, we've been uh, my, at my house. I've got a, a, a couple of little ones, and I've been uh, we've been trying to teach our uh, three-year-old to pray. And it's interesting because a lot of the prayers are very immediate. Um, some of them so immediate they might be about the specific thing that he's eating then and there. It might be, as you know, he's a he's a uh, dinosaur lover, so it's about you know praying for the dinosaurs. Um, but. Uh, I found ourselves over the last couple of weeks being quite busy with work and um, uh, also just with uh, Cell, my wife, being sick, that we were praying a lot just about getting through. It was very day-to-day -day sort of praying. Uh, but when we were sort of going through prayers with my, my son and also catching up with my family who aren't all uh, Christian, um, really appreciated really thinking about our prayer and thinking about uh, the power of God's grace, um, particularly for explain to my son and, and, and to my family who feel that you know, maybe they're not good enough or maybe they haven't done enough uh, to be able to talk to God or to receive his grace. So I thought we'd start today again praying. We're praying together to uh, hear and understand God's power of his grace and how it transforms us. Please join me. Dear God, we ask that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know him better. We pray that the eyes of our hearts may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which he has called us, the riches of your glorious inheritance in your holy people, and your incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength you exerted when you raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked not only in this our present age, but also in the one to come. And you placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Help, us tr help transform us as your church with your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, after you credit, if you have a look at today's uh, newsletter, I've stolen a bit of that from um, Jason Law's blurb at the start, and it really unpacks some of the stuff that uh, we've been thinking about with prayer as well. So I encourage you to have a look at that. And also just as a think about, uh, as we uh, uh, start off today, um, I know we can't sing, but at home in the live stream, please have a sing along. Um, but we'll play a little song just to remind ourselves about uh, 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 being faithful uh, to Jesus, as Jesus is always faithful to us no matter our circumstances.
The kids are going to go off to our kids' church now. So if you just uh, follow up to Sarah, we'll go off into the annex. And Lauren. And Sarah. And we're going to continue our reading, our regular reading today, from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, Kelvin's going to read to us from Mark 2. Thank you. Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the cloud, they make an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and they know what the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He baffling, Who can forgive sin but God's alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their heart. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easy to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full will of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Please 
please join me in uh, this uh, prayer for thanksgiving. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we humbly thank you for all the gifts you have so freely given us, for life and health and safety, for work, rest and friendship, and for all the wonder of creation. But above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for your life-giving spirit and the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I don't know how you've been finding the uh, series we've been doing on Hosea. I have to say that uh, the first exposure I had at Hosea was uh, before uh, I'd come to Christ and finished school and uh, we are doing a, 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 a party where you had to come from something like a book week thing. And I remember one of my friends who was Christian came with a segment of garden hose attached to his ear. I didn't know what he was doing, but it was supposed to be Hosea, I was in Hosea. Hosea, anyway, it went over my head. <laughs> my son had book week this week and I was going to do that, but my wife vetoed that uh, for him. But in seriousness, I think um, it's been a, a, a really, uh, I think, a very striking series to read through. Um, and I think uh, understanding uh, the seriousness of, of, of uh, what God's implications are for us not following, but also that story of redemption has been uh, really marked. So um, uh, Q is going to read to us from Hosea 6 to 7 and before we continue our series. Please uh, join me to Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third, on the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Therefore, I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. Then my judgments go forth like the sun. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. As at Adam, they have broken the covenant. They were unfaithful to me there. Gilead is a city of evildoers, stained with footprints of blood. As marinaders lie in ambush for a victim, so do bands of priests. They murder on the road to Shechem, carrying out their wicked schemes. I have been a horrible, I've seen a horrible thing in Israel. There, Ephraim is given to prostitution. Israel is defiled. Also for you, Judah, a harvest is appointed. Whenever I would restore the fortunes of my people, whenever I would heal Israel, the sins of Ephraim are exposed and the crimes of Samaria revealed. They practice deceit. Thieves break into houses. Bandits rob in the streets. But they do not realize that I remember all the, their evil deeds. Their sins engulf them. They are always before me. They delight the king with their wickedness, the princess with their lies. They are all adulterers, burning like an oven, whose fire the baker need not stir from the kneading of the dough till it rises. On the day of the festival of our king, the princes become inflamed with wine, and he joins hands with the mockers. Their hearts are like an oven. They, are, they approach him with intrigue. Their passion smolders all night. In the morning, it blazes like a flaming fire. All of them are hot as an oven. They devour their rulers. All their kings fall and none of them calls on me. Ephraim mixes with the nations. Ephraim is a flat loaf, not turning o turned over. Foreigners sap his strength, but he does not realize it. 
His hair is sprinkled with gray, but he does not notice. Israel's arrogance testifies against him, but despite all this, he does not return to the Lord his God or search for him. Ephraim is like a dove, easily deceived and senseless, now calling to Egypt, now turning to Assyria. When they go, I will throw my net over them. I will pull them down like the birds in the sky. When I hear them flocking together, I will catch them. Woe to them, because they have strayed from me. Destruction to them, because they have rebelled against me. I long to redeem them, but they speak about me falsely. They do not cry out to me for their, from their hearts, but wail from their beds. They slash themselves, appealing to their gods for grain and new wine, but they turn away from me. I train them and strengthen their arms, but they plot evil against me. They do not turn to the Most High. They are like a faulty bow. Bow. Their leaders will fall by the sword because of their insolent words. For this, they will be ridiculed in the land of Egypt. Good morning, everyone. Hello to everyone on the live stream. It's good to see you and uh, good to be together. Uh, to prevent any speculation and 50 questions at the end of the service, I had a fall, okay? I'm fine. I cut my head, uh, but it's healing. It's mostly covered just because it, it, it's sore and I w- want to protect it. So that's nothing more exciting than that. Uh, Let me pray as we get into uh, Hosea, which is uh, always, always challenging. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for uh, your word. Uh, We thank you for these, uh, uh, for all of it, but particularly for these uh, really challenging uh, and hard parts of scripture uh, that really, uh, I guess, force us to to think uh, and to reflect upon uh, who we are and, and who we are in relation to you. And we pray, Lord, that as we look at uh, Hosea now, that you would speak to us, that, uh, that you would challenge our, our hearts and our minds, uh, that we might live for you uh, more, this day, more, more this day and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. I love British comedy, and one of my favourite shows is Keeping Up Appearances. Uh, It's actually one of the most successful BBC comedies of all time. Uh, If you don't know uh, Keeping Up Appearances, you you should uh, uh, look it up. I'm sure you could watch it on, um, on, uh, you know, iView or or one of those uh, streaming services. But the story follows Hyacinth Bucket, or Hyacinth Bouquet, as she likes to uh, be known, an overbearing social climbing snob in her attempts to prove her social superiority and gain acceptance among those she considers upper class. Hyacinth is forever flaunting her royal Dalton teacups with the hand-painted periwinkles, her candlelight suppers, which in five seasons of the show, I don't think she actually ever held one, uh, her disdain for lower class humour and second-class postage stamps. Uh, Hyacinth was herself originally from a lower-class background, and so her main mission in life was to impress others with her refinement and pretended affluence. But her attempts to do so were constantly thwarted by her lower-class extended family, whom she desperately tried to hide. Now, much of the humour in in this show comes from the conflict between Hyacinth's vision of herself and the reality. And and in each episode, she lands in a farcical situation as she battles to protect her social credibility. And, And I think one of the reasons why Keeping Up Appearances was so successful is because everyone knows a Hyacinth or uh, someone that has elements of a hyacinth. And, and perhaps, actually, just maybe there's a little bit of hyacinth in all of us. You see, we all want others to think well of us. 
We all want others to think well of us. Uh, we live in a world that's dominated by success, and so we live our lives trying to impress. And for, for many people, that might mean living in the right neighbourhood, uh, driving the right car, uh, wearing the right clothes, going to the right parties, uh, being seen with the right people. So let me ask you, how much time and energy do you spend in uh, keeping up appearances, in trying to impress other people? On a scale of zero to ten, how much effort do you put into that stuff? And is it really worth it? You might not be driven by all of the materialistic stuff, but... But actually, even in church circles, there is a, there, or there can be a perceived pressure to be seen a particular way, to maybe have it all together. Uh, and we, we strive to do good, don't we? Uh, but, but our heart motive, what we do, and, the, and, and the, the reason that we do it, well, sometimes they can be worlds apart. We can, get up, get, we can get caught up in trying to, I guess, fool the people around us uh, and, and we think no one notices that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I do or, or, or what my heart motive is as long as it looks good. And this is the problem for Israel, which we see resulted in, th- in, in three heart problems for Israel. In chapter 6 and 7, Hosea, God will expose their shallow love, their shallow knowledge, and their shallow heart. But before we get into it, you'll remember from last week, Jason took us through chapters 4 and 5, where the, where the private life of Hosea has, has faded more into the background, and what's clearly on view now is the relationship between God and Israel. And God accuses Israel of prostitution. They have turned away from God. They have prostituted themselves on idols. Israel is is guilty of of lawlessness, of immorality, of ignorance of God's word and idolatry. And even, even the priests, the ones who should know better, are caught up in it as well. And in chapter 5, God pronounces judgment on Israel. And instead of turning back to God, the Israelites go to the nations for help. Israel turns to Assyria, and and instead of coming to their aid, Assyria swooped in, captured Israel, and carried them off into exile. God's judgment falls upon Israel And uh, verse 14 of chapter 5, we we see this uh, predicted. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, like a great lion to Judah. I will tear them to pieces and go away. I will carry them off with no one to rescue them. Then I will return to my lair until they have borne their guilt and seek my face. In their misery, they will earnestly seek me. And so that sets the scene for chapter 6, which suggests that, well, actually, Israel Israel might be having a change of heart. At the beginning of chapter 6, verse 1, Israel is trusting that God will heal. Uh, Come, let us return to the Lord. He has, he has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. Who is the us? Is it Hosea speaking on behalf of Israel or is it, is it Israel speaking themselves? I actually think uh, what Hosea is recording is Israel speaking. They've heard Hosea. They've heard Hosea prophesy uh, God's coming uh, wrath and, and judgment. And here Israel is responding corporately. And they have the idea that God will revive them, verse 2. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Uh, Notice it's on the third day uh, that God will restore them. And and I got to think, what's this... um, 
uh, thing about the third. It seems that three comes up quite a bit in Scripture. What does it mean? Is there any meaning behind it? Uh, the fact that there were three patriarchs, um, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, that there are three verses in the priestly blessing, uh, that Abraham was commanded to sacrifice Isaac after a three-day journey. Um, Jonah spent three days in the belly of a whale. And the most important of all, Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. So what's the significance of this, uh, this uh, pattern of three? Uh, well, in Scripture, the number three is one of the so-called perfect numbers. And it points particularly to divine perfection. Uh, think the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and in the symbolic language of the Bible, a three-day period points to an act of divine intervention which impacts salvation history. And so here, the Israelites are looking for an act of divine intervention. And they are counting on it like you can count on the rising of the sun. Verse 3, let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains like the spring rains that water the earth. So in, in, back in chapter 4, verse 6, the people had rejected God, but now in chapter 6, verse 3, they're, they're coming to seek a, a, a knowledge of God, and we have this beautiful imagery of the dawning sun, of spring rains and, uh, and uh, spring showers. It's the image of, of rebirth and, and renewal, of of starting afresh, a new day. The people of Israel, they're, they're expressing, expressing their, their, the belief that God will be faithful, that he will be relentlessly loving, even when they are unloving. And so in these first few verses of chapter 6, at, at first glance, things are looking good. Uh, it, it's a good response it appears the people are turning back to God. But as we go on, we discover something's missing. At the end of chapter 5, God says there are two things that need to happen. Uh, Israel has done the second, but they haven't done the first. If you're looking on in your, in your Bibles or on your phones, uh, at the end of chapter 5... Then I will return to my lair until they have borne their guilt and seek my face. In their misery, they will earnestly seek me. What have they done? What haven't they done? Well, it certainly seems that they, have, they, they are seeking God out, aren't they? But, but they haven't borne their guilt. They haven't owned up to their offence. And maybe, maybe this is something God is saying to you. But maybe you don't want to acknowledge the things that you've done wrong. Perhaps you are earnestly seeking God and striving, striving to live faithfully for him now, but, but there are things in the past... Uh, things you've done, things you've said, whatever it might be, past sins that you've been unwilling to acknowledge. If we don't acknowledge our sins, God sees through that. God sees everything. We, we might be able to put up a front for others, uh, we might be able to convince other people around us that, that we're something that we're not. But God sees through that. He sees us exactly as we are. And God sees Israel exactly for who they are. And he accuses them of a shallow love. Verse 4, what can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? 
Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Uh, You'll see both northern and southern kingdoms are uh, are brought into this now. Ephraim is referring uh, to uh, the north. It's another way to refer to the northern kingdom. And and Judah is mentioned as well. So they're both guilty of of this. And their, their love, he says, it's like a morning mist. It's there, but it doesn't last. Uh, like uh, you've seen, no doubt, uh, uh, the fog that sometimes sits over Sydney, over the city. Uh, and, and if you're driving towards the city, you can't see anything. It's just this blanket of fog. All the buildings are gone. The bridge is gone. Uh, it, it's like there's nothing there. Planes are grounded at the airport. Uh, and, and then the day warms up and eventually the fog dissipates. It, it melts away. God's saying, that's what Israel's love is like. He says, I can see what you're doing, Israel. Your your love, it'll disappear. Verse 6, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice, an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. In other words, God desires genuine, faithful love. But Israel's love, it's shallow. It's about being seen to be doing the right things. And in chapter 4, verse 13, Israel, they were, they were offering sacrifices, uh, but, they, but they weren't doing it how they were supposed to be doing it. They, they were meant to be going up to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices, but chapter 4 says they were sacrificing on the mountaintops. They were giving burnt offerings on the hills, under oak and poplar and terebinth, where the shade is pleasant. And so Hosea says, therefore your daughters turn to prostitution and your daughter-in-law, daughters-in-law to adultery. Even in the, the act of their offering, they are disobedient. And God sees straight through their religious actions and sees their shallow love. The, the covenantal promise it's a commitment to, to love, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And that's not what they're showing. And even the priests are failing. The priests had two jobs, to be the leaders of the people and to serve as an intermediary between God and humanity between God and the people. Yet what are they doing? Verse 9, this seems extraordinary. They're they're killing people. As marauders lie in ambush for a victim, so do bands of priests. They murder on the road to Shechem, carrying out their wicked schemes. The priests who, who, who should know better are doing completely the opposite to what they should be doing. They should be shepherding the people, loving and caring for the people. Yet it seems like maybe on their days off, they get together in groups and go, what are we going to do today? Let's go kill some people. It just seems extraordinary. Israel's love is so shallow and so superficial. And this shallow love feeds into a shallow knowledge. Uh, Chapter 7, verse 1. They practice deceit. Thieves break into houses. Bandits rob in the streets. But they do not realise that I remember all their evil deeds, says the Lord. Their sins engulf them. They are always before me. God says, I'm going to return my people, but your evil deeds need to be dealt with, and the issue is you don't even see it. That's what he's saying to Israel. Your evil deeds need to be dealt with, but you can't see it. But God sees it. He remembers it. He remembers it all, thoughts, words and deeds. He sees it all, and he's going to bring it right up into their faces. God will show them their evil, and particularly in their choice of leadership. 
And from verses 3 to 7, we have the, the imagery of an oven. Uh, it's a simile to, to emphasize Israel's adultery. It describes how sin develops. They delight the king with their wickedness, the princes with their lies. They are all adulterers, burning like an oven, whose fire the baker need not stir from the kneading of the dough till it rises. I don't know if you're familiar with baking bread. I've had a go at it once or twice, um, but I've certainly never baked bread in a wood oven. I uh, don't know if you've ever, ever tried it, but basically what would happen, the baker would set the fire... Uh, and, and then leave it to heat the oven up. Uh, and whilst the oven was heating, he'd be working or kneading the dough. And to bake, to bake bread, you'd need a really hot oven, like 220, 230 degrees. So it needs to be really hot. And so like a fire set in an oven, Israel's evil has been burning and building. The oven is getting hotter and hotter and hotter, and the point is that Israel was so inflamed with desire and passion for the idols of the nations, it was like a fire building in an oven. And Hosea explains, continuing on with this simile, that as evil catches fire, it grows and it grows. And that's what sin does, doesn't it? Verse 6, their hearts are like an oven. They approach him with intrigue. Their passion smoulders all night. In the morning, it blazes like a flaming fire. And then he concludes the, uh, the, the simile with the, the broader picture. He states, verse 7, all of them are as hot as an oven. They devour their rulers. All their kings fail uh, or fall, sorry, and none of them calls on me. And, and so this fire has been growing, it's been heating up the oven, evil continues to grow and grow, sin grows, and they can't see their evil actions, and now it comes to a head. It's such a consuming fire that all the kings of Israel are taken down. Israel itself is fuel for the fire. And you can see this play out in 2 Kings 14 to 17, that period after Jeroboam the second, Six kings of Israel in 30 years, and most of them die by bloodshed, betrayal, and conspiracy. And what does Israel do? Well, they don't call on the Lord. They call on the nations instead. Verse 8, Ephraim mixes with the nations. Ephraim is a flat loaf, not turned over. Israel calls on everyone except the one they should have called on. Uh, verse 11, Ephraim is like a dove, easily deceived and senseless, now calling to Egypt, now turning to Assyria. And Hosea says it makes Israel weaker. Verse 9, foreigners sap his strength, but he does not realize it. His hair is sprinkled with grey, but he does not notice. Israel's arrogance testifies against him, but despite all this, he does not return to the Lord, his God, or search for him. Shallow love, shallow knowledge, means they can't turn to God. And this exposes their shallow heart. Verse 13 uh, in verse 13, God wants to rescue them, but he says, Woe to them because they have strayed from me. Destruction to them because they have rebelled against me. I long to redeem them, God says, but they speak about me falsely. And if you're looking on, look at verse 14. There's a lot of action, but uh, there's a lot happening, but it's, it's not from a sincere heart. It says, they do not cry out to me from their beds, uh, from their hearts, but wail on their beds. They behave like petulant children chucking a tantrum. Have you ever been in that situation? You're in the supermarket and your kid decides to chuck a tanty right there in the middle of the aisle 
They're on their back, kicking and banging their arms and kicking their legs and screaming at the tops of their voices. So embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> happened to us once or twice. We just stepped over them and kept on going. But that's what they're behaving like, like petulant children, the, the entire nation. And then it says they slash themselves, appealing to their gods for grain and new wine, but they turn away from me. Uh, it's the, the slashing yourself, it's, 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 it's a graphic uh, uh, image, but it was part of the the worship of the Baal gods. Uh, it alludes to 1 Kings 18, uh, where Elijah challenged uh, Israel to turn away from the Baal gods and to return to the Lord their God. In, in, in verse 21 of um, 1 Kings 18, Elijah challenged the people. He said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Couldn't be any clearer than that, could it? But then Elijah devises this test, verse 22. Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophet choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire, he is God." And so the people called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar that they had made. And still there's no response. Then Elijah began to taunt them. And I love this bit, verse 27. He said, shout leader, surely he is a god. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy, or travelling. Love the sarcasm. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. Fancy a god who sleeps. Anyway. So they shouted louder and, 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 and slashed themselves. They cut themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Now, a couple of hundred years later, God's people are doing exactly the same thing. They've turned away from God, verse 14, and they are slashing themselves as was the custom of the nations who worshipped the pagan gods. Who did they turn to? They turned to the nations. They turned to the Baals. They didn't turn to the one whom they should have turned. They've turned away from the Most High God, verse 16. And Hosea proclaims, they are like a faulty bow. Their leaders will fall by the sword because of their insolent words. For this they will be ridiculed in the land of Egypt. And throughout the rest of Hosea, we will see how they will reap the consequences of their turning. But what does this all mean? mean for us? I think the question for us is, what can we learn from the mistakes Israel made? You see, everyone, everyone turns to someone or something. And Jesus actually stated exactly that in Matthew 6, verse 24, where he said, no one can serve to masters, either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. Now, Jesus was, of course, talking specifically about slavery to money. But Paul expanded that idea of slavery in Romans 6 because of the simple fact is that we are all slaves. 
We are all slaves. He says that we are either slaves to sin or we are slaves to righteousness. And if you are following along uh, in your Bibles, I want you to flip over to Romans 6 and verse 16. He says, don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. And verse 20, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is calling us to turn our hearts to him. Not just our actions, but our hearts. Because it's not enough to be seen to be doing the right thing. It's not about keeping up appearances. The challenge of chapter 6, verse 1, come, let us return to the Lord, is not just a call to Israel, it's a call for us as well. And how do we return? We return through his son, through the Lord Jesus. And note the parallels of uh, that uh, verse 2 earlier on with what we know of Jesus' ministry. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Jesus, Jesus is the only one who fulfills that. Jesus is the one who died on the cross for our sins and on the third day fulfills verse 2. So we are to return to God in Jesus because, because the death Jesus died, he died for us. And when he died, we also died, Paul says. See the logic of this, uh, Romans 6 verse 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And so when Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, you died, I died, we all died with him if we are in Christ And then that shadow of life, that broken life that we used to live, has also died. Through Christ, we've undergone spiritual transformation, and so we are no longer slaves to sin. And as his death was our death, so his resurrection is our life too. Verse 10, the death he died, who died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's what Jesus has done for us. Incredible, isn't it? Romans 6, along with Hosea, serves as a reminder to us of what God requires of us. God longs for us to return to him. What he requires of us is not shallow love or shallow knowledge or shallow faith. What God longs to see in us is faithful love, faithful knowledge, and a faithful heart. Because we've been set free from sin to enjoy new life in Christ, that life has nothing to do with being seen to do the right thing. For we know, this is verse 6, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. So let me ask you a question. If God were to look at your heart, what would he see? 
Would he see someone who is just going through the motions, turning up to church or growth group, but not really engaging? Might he see you serving, but not out of a sense of joy, but more out of a, a misguided sense of obligation? Because the, well, the important thing is to be looked up to and to be praised and to be appreciated. Would he see someone who is really just about appearances with a shallow love, a shallow knowledge and a shallow heart? But it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter what other people think of us. You see, ultimately we play to an audience of one. The only one whose opinion of us actually matters, the only one who sees us exactly who we are, is the Lord Jesus. And knowing exactly who we are and what we're like, that we all, in one way or another, at some time or another, show our shallow love and our shallow knowledge and our shallow heart. He died for that. He died for you and he died for me. And so I want you to cling to the Lord Jesus. I want you to know the deep, deep love of God which surpasses knowledge because Jesus is the one who made it possible to turn to God in the first place. Let me finish with Paul's words from Ephesians 3. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen. Uh, please join with me as I continue in prayer for our congregation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we may approach you through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, as we present our prayers, praises and requests to you. Please help us to remain steadfast in reliance of your grace and sovereignty, trusting faithfully, praying with conviction that your loving ear would hear and your hand would be continually at work in this world. This morning, we bring before you the many efforts to make Christ known in our congregation, within our local area and throughout the world. We pray for parish council who selflessly serve our congregational needs. Please bestow on them continued wisdom and faithfulness to make decisions that positively impact St Mark's as we collectively aspire to every person made new in Christ, mature in Christ, making Christ known. Thank you, Lord, for our youth ministry that continues to bear fruit. Thank you for the commitment and care of the leaders. We ask that each may experience renewed fervour as they seed your gospel in the lives of many, that through their faithful instruction, fellowship and loving example, many more youth would be encouraged to entrust themselves to you for your glory and that of your kingdom. We bring before you our local nursing home ministry for sustained health of residents and meaningful connections that encourage trust in Jesus. Please equip and resource residents so that they may be compelled to live for Christ, running the race with perseverance to its full completion. As we consider the vastness of our world that needs to know you, please use your guiding hand and gracious provision to continue to raise up godly leaders, fostering the growth of these disciples through Christ-centred institutions as vessels to faithfully and relentlessly proclaim your word to all corners of the earth. 
We bring before you now our link missionaries, Peter and Terry Blouse. Please keep them safe and healthy, continuing to build them up as tireless workers for your cause. We praise your ministry in Bolivia, that despite suffering severely from the impacts of the pandemic and political instability, Peter was able to lead an encouraging workshop on discipleship in COVID times. We also continue to pray for IFES and ABUA, that you would continue to guide and enable a new start for ABUA, despite the recent lack of focus. Please allow Peter and Terry to be shining beacons of godliness to all they meet, knowing how best to serve and love their friends, modeling grace to students and other leaders, that all may continue to trust in you. We ask that you would be active in resolving COVID-related issues, particularly in Argentina, where case counts continue to rise, and you might raise more workers for the harvest to service the many ministry opportunities that exist and remain unfulfilled. In reflecting on this great spiritual need, please help each of us to be generous in supporting gospel ministry, both financially and freely with the unique gifts which you have equipped each of us. We commit all these prayers to you, assured and thankful that you hear them, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. There's a couple of announcements to have a look at through the newsletter. Uh, the two that I would uh, get you to have a look at um, on the 7th of November, um, uh, Stephen, uh, who uh, is thankfully doing some of our scripture ministry and hopefully will be able to bridge uh, with Matchville Sports High. It's uh, been a long-standing challenge. Um, uh, needs our support with prayer and also our generosity. And they're going to do, a, uh, as part of that, a little bit of a scone drive. And if you're like me, I do like the scones with the jam and cream. So there is some immediate benefit from it, but really to help support and pray for him. And also, um, uh, just a reminder about the uh, SAFE ministry, um, that uh, uh, to get the questionnaires in and the responses in for Alex so that he has time to process them and just make sure that everything's in order. Uh, also, um, just as a reminder around some updates around uh, mingling and COVID. So ideally, if um, you're going to hang around to try and uh, sit down in the uh, designated areas to be able to chat with each other, rather than sort of standing each other closely, where it's possible to maintain your distancing, masks are no longer mandatory, but um, at the same token, if you can, um, when you are talking uh, uh, to each other um, uh, and you're not able to maintain your distance to be able to uh, uh, keep your mask on if you, if you choose to do that as well. And when you come to church now, um, use the hand sanitizer, and also um, uh, to sign in with the QR code that's out the front as well. Uh, Alex finished with a, a great prayer from Ephesians 3, and it's to remind us that uh, Christ dwells in our hearts uh, through faith, and to have, for us to have the power to grasp um, uh, how enormous and deep and wide um, and high God's uh, 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 love is and so let's uh, remind ourselves of that um, uh, through another song as we finish uh, yet not I but through Christ Oh 
Um, Ian's going to share with us one more announcement uh, before we finish up. Thanks. Um, hello everyone, um, my name is Ian, um, and I'm here on behalf of the parish nominators. So I've got Irene and Karen with me, um, and there's Robert coming up, and, and, and the other one, uh, the, the other nominator is Jimmy, who, who's not make, able to make it today. So who are, who are the parish, parish nominators? We're elected every year at the AGM, and most years as a parish, parish nominator, you don't have to do anything. But when you lose a minister, the parish nominators are tasked with finding the replacement. So today I'm, I'm here to announce that we have completed our, our search for a new rector. Um, and so, you know, we, we had Simon Roberts had his last ministry day with us in, back in March before finishing for, uh, on the 11th of May. We've been very lucky to have been uh, served by, by, our local, uh, by our local minister, Alex, who has looked after us so well during this time. Uh, the process has been lengthy and the nominators have worked hard to find the best candidate. Uh, while I should just jump to the result, uh, it's important for you to know that a, a robust process was followed in selecting the best candidate. Uh, we started with 35 ministers contacted. Uh, we sent out 19 parish profiles. Uh, we had 15 interested. Um, the process included multiple interviews, listening to sermons, speaking to refer referees, and uh, assessing CVs. The decision was made as a nomination board, which involved the parish nominators here, as well as four diocesan nominators, and all overseen by, uh, by Bishop Michael Stead. So the person we've selected, uh, hang on, slides, sorry, there, um, is, is Gavin Poole. Um, apologies that it's a little bit small, so I'll actually read out his, his, his bio. Um, Gav spent his formative years in the Sutherland Shire. He turned to Christ at the age of 19. He studied a Bachelor of Business at UTS and spent some years in marketing before entering Theological College. He's been the Senior Minister at Cherrybrook Anglican for the past 16 years. Before that, he served in the Episcopal Diocese of Dallas in Texas for four years. Gav is married to Bron, who works as a midwife at the Sand Hospital. They have three children, Tom, currently at UNSW, Emma, planning to attend UTS next year, and Sophie, currently finishing the HSC. Both Gav and Bron enjoy coffee dates and showing hospitality. Gav enjoys water sports, including windsurfing and fishing. Gav has recently acquired a new skill, playing acoustic guitar. Thankfully, all of them know of God's love in Christ and are being shaped into his image. They send their love and are looking forward to joining their brothers and sisters in Christ at Malabar. And so the aim will be Gav will start with us in mid-Feb. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to approach any of your nominators um, over morning tea. And um, Alex has kindly volunteered to say a few words and pray, so I'll hand over to Alex. I asked if I could say a few words following uh, the announcement of Gav's appointment to St Mark's uh, because... Uh, um, I know that there will be people who, who are feeling disappointed for, for us. Um, but firstly, I wanted to say uh, I really want to thank you all for uh, how you so immediately welcomed uh, Susanna and I and the kids, although you haven't seen much of them, uh, to St Mark's when we first came in May uh, to be your acting rector. Um, and uh, there were times where I thought to myself, do I need to remind them I'm... I'm just here as a locum. Um, and also, I want to thank you for the, the many uh, expressions of uh, you know, quiet comments on the side of, we're praying that you can stay, or we hope you can stay. Um, they uh, meant uh, uh, certainly a lot to me. Um, we are disappointed, completely upfront and honest about that. Uh, we are disappointed. We would have loved to have stayed. Uh, but I, what I want to do, and this is the most important part, I want to publicly affirm the decision of the nominators. They have made a superb choice. Uh, it's not an easy task that they've gone through these last months. Uh, it's an extraordinarily difficult task, made all the more difficult by COVID. Um, and, and they have sought God's uh, guidance and wisdom 
uh, on the decision that has been made. Um, and I believe um, that God has led them to the decision that they have made. Um, and so uh, I, Gav uh, and Bron and I have a little bit of background. I've known them for uh, quite a long time. Uh, Bron and I used to lead Bible study together years ago at our home church, St Andrews Warunga, back in the early 90s. Um, so we do go back a ways. I was at their wedding. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of each other in recent years, only because of uh, geography and um, the busyness of life and ministry. But I, I hold them both in extremely high regard. And they are wonderful people and wonderful ministers. And they will serve you well and they will love you well. And so I want to... Um, as you embraced us, I want you to embrace them um, because uh, they are great people. Uh, so I want to, I want to, uh, yeah, just say thanks. Uh, we, my commitment, as I've expressed to the nominators and also to Gav, uh, is to do whatever I can in the weeks between now and when, when they come, uh, to smooth the way uh, for for their coming, um, and uh, and so I'll do whatever I can to to assist in that process. And I would really value your prayers for us as we're not sure what's next for us. We know God has a plan. Um, he had a plan and a purpose in bringing us here. Uh, and he has a plan and a purpose in wherever we go next. There are a couple of options that we're looking at, but things are very much in their, uh, shall we say, in their infancy. Uh, so I would really uh, yeah, value your prayers. Um, it would be really great if we could move from here to the next thing. But at this point, I'm thinking that's probably unrealistic. Um, but God is a big God, uh, so who knows? So please pray for us in that. That'd be great. But let's now uh, pause to pray and give thanks for the nominators and the work that they've done, um, and also for Gav and Bron and their kids. Heavenly Father, we do uh, thank you and praise you for, uh, for uh, after what has felt like a, a long time and a long process, um, but hasn't actually been too bad, um, that uh, a, a, a godly man has been chosen uh, to lead uh, this parish into its future. Uh, thank you so much for the hard work that each of the nominators have done over these past months in uh, screening uh, candidates and conducting interviews and uh, reading uh, CVs and uh, talking to referees. Um, uh, thank you for all the, the, the work that they've done, that they've done it prayerfully and that they've done it seeking your uh, guidance and wisdom. Uh, and thank you that, they've led the, that you have led them to, to Gav and to Bron um, and their family uh, to come here to minister at St Mark's um, uh, into its future. Um, uh, I thank you for, uh, for this family and I thank you for uh, who they are, who they are in Christ and uh, how they have loved and served their church family at Cherrybrook these last 16 years and how all their experiences have shaped and equipped them to, uh, to come here to lead St Mark's. Uh, please be with them as they say, as they make a similar announcement today uh, of their of their leaving Cherrybrook, no doubt there is much sadness and grief um, uh, in that place today, um, and some very hard conversations are being had today, and will continue uh, to be had in the weeks to come for Gavin Bron and their kids. Uh, but we ask, Lord, that you'd smooth their way here, uh, that uh, uh, that you'll fill them with excitement uh, for the uh, the the task ahead. Uh, and that you'll be preparing uh, your people here to receive them, uh, to welcome them and to love them. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've lots of heavy stuff to think about, uh, but uh, really significant things um, from, from the talks that we've had, uh, reflecting on Isaiah, but also for our relationships with... Um, Pinters and uh, thankful for the nominators and Jason and uh, who's, who's, uh, and, and Sylvia have helped us through all this time. Let's uh, pray as we close. Dear Jesus, 
we sometimes show you our shallow love and our shallow knowledge and our shallow heart. And we are sometimes big on our appearances to each other, but you see everything about us. Thank you that you died for our shallowness and our sin. Now that we have died with you, help us count ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in you, Christ. Help sin no longer be our master, but let us live under grace. May you dwell in our hearts through faith, and may we have the power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is your love, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Help us to have faithful love, faithful knowledge, and a faithful heart, as you are eternally faithful to us. Amen. I hope you hang around, have a chat, and thank you for everyone at home, the live stream. A good week. Thank you.